In this video, we'll be continuing the topic, how do stars shine? In this video, you'll be looking at star formation. This lecture is presented by Dr. John T. Horner. Welcome to the second main content video on the topic about how stars shine. In this slightly shorter video, which will be very discursive, very descriptive, I'll be talking through the birth of a young star and explaining how stars come to be in the very first place. The point I'm going to start at is with a beautiful photograph of a fairly nearby galaxy called the Whirlpool Galaxy, which goes by the wonderful catalogue number of Messier 51. So I'll just bring that picture up for you for a moment. This image was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, and I'll just let you drink that in for a few seconds before I explain what you're seeing. So the Whirlpool Galaxy is a galaxy very similar to our own Milky Way. The main bulk of the galaxy, which you can see the beautiful spiral structure in the image, is very much like our own spiral galaxy, the Milky Way. If we were looking at our own galaxy from a great distance like this, we're looking face on. And our sun would lie about one third of the way from the centre of the disk to the edge of the disk in one of the curved spiral arms, which you can see coming out from the centre in a clockwise direction. The first thing that's really obvious about the curved, the spiral galaxy, is that the bulk of the colour of the spiral arms is blue. And as I'll explain in the next lecture, that blue colour comes from the most luminous stars, which are very hot, and that's why they're blue stars. The centre of the galaxy is much more yellowy coloured, and that's because the stars at the centre of the galaxy are significantly older, and so the very luminous blue stars have died, and the next brightest stars are the yellow stars. So that's why there's much more of a yellow colour at the centre. And again, I'll explain that a little bit more in the next lecture. But the thing that's key for the start of this lecture are the bright pink areas in the spiral arms, which are regions where stars have recently been born, and the dark dust lanes that mottle the spiral arms, where there's a huge amount of dust blocking the light from the background stars. And these are the areas in which new stars are continually being born, their stellar nurseries. On a smaller scale, then, you can see that our galaxy and all galaxies are full of stars. And they've got a huge amount of empty space in them as well. But they also contain vast clouds of gas and dust. And we call these, the biggest ones, giant molecular clouds. And in a moment, I'll bring up a couple of photographs of such clouds one after the other so that you can see the kind of thing I'm talking about. Firstly, this is a picture of the night sky near the constellation Crux, and you'll become very familiar with Crux, which is the Southern Cross, when you do the little task that we're putting along with this topic. In the photograph, you can see two bright stars at the lower corner. The yellower one of those stars is Alpha Centauri, which is the nearest sun-like star to the Earth. And the light from that has only taken 4.3 years to reach us, travelling at the speed of light. You can also see the Southern Cross, the four stars making the shape of a kite. And just next to the cross, you can see a dark patch against the background of the Milky Way, our galaxy. The dark patch that you're seeing there is a cloud of dust called the coal sack. It's a coal sack nebula. And that's a very large cloud of dust, probably as big as 100 light years across, meaning that if light could get through the dust, it would take about 100 years to travel from one side to the other of the cloud. And that's one example of a giant molecular cloud. It's one that you can see if you get to a very dark site, probably out of Sydney, and look up at the Southern Cross, you can see the coal sack with the naked eye as a dark patch against the Milky Way. And the reason that the coal sack is dark, the reason it's black, is that all of the light from stars behind the coal sack is blocked by the nebula and doesn't reach us. So the only stars you see in the area of that cloud of dust and gas are the stars that are on our line of sight between us and that cloud of gas and dust. The second image I'm showing you here is of another giant molecular cloud called Barnard 8. It's a very large cloud of gas and dust in which we know stars are forming right now. But because there's so much gas and dust there, the light from those stars that are now forming can't escape. It's blocked by the dust, and you can see nothing within it. In fact, you can see one of the other interesting effects of the dust here. If you look at the edges of the cloud of dust, where the dust is thinnest, some of the light from stars behind the cloud of dust is passing through the dust. And just like when you look at the sunset, especially on a dusty evening, the, the light from those stars is reddened, 
As a short wavelength light, the blue light and the yellow light is absorbed by the dust while the red light gets through. So for the same reason as the sunset is red, because blue light and yellow light is scattered by dust much more efficiently than red light is, the stars that are peeking through the edges of the cloud look a lot redder than they would do if the cloud wasn't there, because the cloud is absorbing, is scattering a lot of the blue and yellow light from those stars, leaving only the red light to reach us. And it's in clouds of gas and dust like this that the star formation process begins. To give you an idea of the scale of these clouds, they can be anything from maybe 15 light years across to 600 light years across. One light year being the distance it takes, like the distance that light will travel in one year. So again, to remind you, light travels at 300,000 kilometers every second. Our moon, therefore, is slightly more than one light second away. The sun, which is 150 million kilometers away, the light from the sun takes 8.3 light minutes to reach us. It takes 8.3 minutes to reach us. So a very small cloud is still 15 light years across. It's unimaginably vast. The largest clouds can be up to 600 light years across. And within that huge volume of space, there's an incredible amount of material in gas and dust, ranging from, at the small end, maybe a 1,000 times the mass of our sun, up to, at the top end, about 10 million times the mass of our sun. And that's the material that will go on to one day form a new generation of stars. What happens with these clouds of gas and dust is that eventually they start to collapse under their own gravity. All of the bits of gas, all of the bits of dust, exert a gravitational pull on their neighbors. And if something happens to just nudge them, the cloud can start to collapse under its own gravity. It's no longer held in equilibrium by things moving around, and gravity starts to pull the material in the cloud smaller and smaller. And within the cloud, it tends to fragment. So you don't just get one star forming that has 10 million times the mass of our sun. That just wouldn't work. That star would be incredibly spectacular, but would tear itself apart. Instead, the cloud fragments as it collapses, and you get fragments forming stars ranging from about 1% of the mass of our sun up to about 100 times the mass of our sun. The upper limit for the mass of a star is set by the mass at which the star will tear itself apart. The lower mass is set by the mass at which the star will be able to shine. And I'll come on to that a little bit later on. But in any given clump, a cloud of gas and dust that was initially maybe a few light years across, maybe a bit smaller than that, will collapse down. And as it collapses, as you remember from your discussions of temperature, pressure, and volume in the earlier topics, if you shrink the volume down dramatically, the pressure and the temperature will increase. So you collapse this huge, very cold cloud of gas and dust, and the cloud of gas and dust will initially be maybe only two or three degrees Kelvin. That's two or three degrees above absolute zero, very, very cold. But you're collapsing it down from light years across to being the size of our solar system, and eventually the size of our sun. So you're vastly reducing the volume, so the temperature and pressure increase dramatically. And what eventually happens is that at the very center of what we call a protostar, a star that's forming from the gas and dust, the temperature and pressure eventually become sufficiently high that nuclear fusion can begin. And nuclear fusion is a process by which hydrogen atoms are rammed together, stuck together, to form helium. Nuclear fusion is an incredibly efficient, incredibly powerful source of energy. And as such, once a star starts burning, once a star starts undergoing nuclear fusion, the fusion causes a huge amount of energy to stream out from the core of the star. And the pressure of that radiation supports the outer layers of the star against the collapse due to gravity. The star achieves equilibrium, and the collapse stops, and a star is born. And the radiation pressure pushing outwards from the core is enough to balance out the inward effects of gravity trying to cause the star to collapse. In much the same way, as the pressure, the force between the molecules in the Earth is strong enough to prevent the material in the Earth continuing to collapse inwards. In the Earth, the source of that force is the interaction between different atoms and different molecules. In the Sun and in stars, the main source of that outward pressure is radiation pressure. The energy that you create in the core of a star is transported to the star's surface and once it reaches the surface of the star, it's radiated away as the light that we see from the stars. But the energy itself is created right in the central core of the star, in the central 10% or so of the star's width. And the way that that energy is transported from the central region of the star to the surface can either be through convection or through radiation. And that depends on what kind of star the star is, 
how massive the star is, and also whereabouts in the diameter of the star you're interested in. But again, both of those concepts should be familiar to you because you talked about them earlier on in this course. Again, you're taking physics principles that you learned, for example, when you were boiling a kettle, and instead of applying them to a kettle, you're now applying them to the stars that you see in the night sky. The situation is dramatically different, but the physics is very, very similar. Once the stars have turned on, and they're kicking out all this radiation, they become very active. You see a star, and the radiation streaming from the surface of the star exerts a pressure on the gas and dust surrounding it. And that radiation, coupled with something we call a stellar wind, where the star's throwing material away like a wind blowing outwards from the star, rapidly sweeps away the gas and dust surrounding our youthful star, and instead of the star being shrouded locally in gas and dust, it starts to clear a bubble out around it. So in this final image for this lecture, I'm going to show you the Orion Nebula, one of the most famous stellar nurseries in the night sky. Now this is a very spectacular photograph of the nebula, and I'll just bring that up and let you drink it in for a moment. So, the blue nebulosity you can see at the side of the image is something we call a reflection nebula. And that's some gas and dust that is being illuminated by the blue stars that are in the foreground, and the blue light is like being reflected from those stars to the Earth. The part we're interested in here from the stellar nursery point of view is a pink area towards the centre of the image. What I want you to imagine here is that the entire image is wreathed in gas and dust, and that gas and dust stretches into the depth of the screen, going back for many, many light years. And buried within that cloud of gas and dust, new stars are forming. One cluster of new stars has formed near the edge of this cloud of gas and dust, near to the Earth on the earthward side of the gas and dust. And as that cluster of stars have all started to shine, have turned on, their stellar wind and the radiation they're giving off have blown a bubble within the gas and dust cloud. Now initially this bubble will start out quite small and is buried within the gas cloud, within the gas and dust, so we can't see it. And the light from the stars will be blocked from us, scattered by the dust we couldn't see them. As time goes on, the bubble gets bigger and bigger until it eventually breaks through the outer edge of the cloud pointing towards us. And then we're looking down into the cavity that's been hollowed out by this cluster of stars. And if you look at that pink area there, you're looking into the nebula in, in three dimensions, into this cavity that's been hollowed out by a young cluster of stars in the Orion Nebula called the Trapezium. And the pink light you're seeing there is not reflected light, but rather the last remnants of the hydrogen gas floating around in that cavity that are being excited by the light from these very young hot stars and re-radiating away at a very specific frequency. Um, in this case, the light is what we call hydrogen alpha light, which is at about 656 nanometers in wavelength. And this is exactly the same process through which the mercury light and the sodium light you discussed back in topic one worked. In the case of the mercury light and the sodium light, you had a vapor of mercury or sodium, you pass an electric current through it, you excite those gases, and they radiate at very specific wavelengths, at very specific colors. Here, you've got the same situation. You've got hydrogen gas being excited by the ultraviolet light coming off these stars. That hydrogen gas is excited and then re-radiates that energy at very specific wavelengths, which is why these kind of nebulae, which we call emission nebulae, glow pink. And that's why those star-forming areas in the Whirlpool galaxy we showed at the very start of this subsection of the topic were pink. Those were areas where young stars had recently formed, and those stars were exciting the hydrogen gas around them, causing it to glow with hydrogen alpha light. So that's the end of the story of how stars form. In the third video that we're going to show here, we're going to talk about how the stars actually shine. We'll talk a little bit more about the nuclear fusion that goes on in their cores, and we'll also talk about how long they live and how their brightness varies from one star to the next. Special thanks to Sebastian Frick for filming and editing this video. Also thanks to these people who provided photos with a Creative Commons license that we made use of.